But don't, don't forget, I'm a strict Catholic. I agree with that senator at Senatorium. Says if we let this stuff go too far, pretty soon we'll be fucking dogs. In the course of just 25 years, Clovis, the first of the Merovingians, united the Frankish people, adopted Roman Christianity, and laid the foundations for a kingdom that would last two and a half centuries. By the time of his death at age 45 in the early 6th century AD, Clovis' legacy was secure. As the old Frankish tongue gave way to French, the name Clovis became Louis making him the namesake to 18 different kings of France. One could make the argument that Clovis was the most effective and memorable Frankish ruler until Charlemagne himself. And yet, none of these things changed the fact that Clovis was a thug. A thug that God had chosen to perform his miracles. That is, more or less, how the bishop and historian Gregory of Tours, our narrator for much of this period, would put it though perhaps not in those exact words. To our pious but practical narrator, it was clear that God's will could be enacted even by the most vicious of his servants, one who cheated, lied, murdered, and betrayed everyone around him, spilling the blood of foes, friends, and family members alike. The thing is, Clovis had done all of this in pursuit of victory. And since victory for Clovis meant victory for Roman Catholicism, this barbarian king would not be remembered as a bloody Attila, Alaric, or Genghis Khan. It is almost as if the blood on Clovis's hands would transubstantiate into the fruit of Christendom in a reversal of the Eucharist limited to Christ's royal followers. It was not for kings to be entirely innocent. Kings could break the rules set down for others, because ruling was a hard business, especially in the Dark Ages. A king simply could not be expected to act like a saint. And as we shall see, the saints of this era were not entirely innocent either. When Clovis died, he left behind four sons to whom he equally partitioned his kingdom, roughly corresponding to the region of modern France. This would be a mistake, and it was only a matter of time before Clovis's sons were at one another's throats. But because an open confrontation would probably not sit well with their followers, the sons of Clovis resorted to schemes, plots, and conquests of surrounding territory, all in the hope of gaining the upper hand against one another and thereby reuniting Francia under one ruler. The eldest of Clovis's sons, Theuderic, ruled the northern part of the kingdom from the city of Metz. The next son, Clodomer, ruled southwest of him in Orléans. Childebert ruled a region sandwiched between them in Paris. And the youngest, Clotaire, who would outlast all of them, ruled northeast of Paris in Soissons. Clovis's famed widow, Clotilde, was mother to the younger three, while the eldest son, Theuderic, was born by one of Clovis's earlier wives or concubines, the distinction still not being clear in those days. Clovis's eldest son, Theuderic, already had a capable and martially inclined son of his own, Theudebert, of whom we will hear more shortly. At varying times, 
the four sons of Clovis were at odds with the neighboring Thuringians, Burgundians, Visigoths, and other wandering barbarian peoples now settled, enacting their own bloody dramas as they carved up their realms, which orbited the fractured Frankish kingdom like so many doomed planets with alien inhabitants clinging to alien ways. Although the Burgundians had embraced Catholicism, the roots of their conflict with the Franks ran deep, nourished on the sort of blood feud that serves to remind us of the not-so-distant pagan past. Clovis's widow, Clotild, a Burgundian princess who hailed from that southeastern land, accused the ruling branch of the family of murdering her parents. To avenge her mother and father, she urged her sons to make war. But in doing so, she unknowingly occasioned the death of her son, Clodomer, who would die in the fighting that ensued. Although their first campaign in Burgundy seems to have been reasonably successful, the second one was a disaster. We are told that the Burgundians lured Clotilde's son, Clodomer, toward their ranks by imitating the war cry of his army, before surrounding him, hacking off his head, and impaling it on a stake that they paraded around the battlefield. Despite presenting a unified front, the Merovingians were forced to retire and lick their wounds. Three brothers now remained, Clotaire, the youngest, Childebert, the middle child, and Thuderic, the oldest, all of whom seem to have taken part in this second campaign. This is curious, because Thuderic was half-brother to the other sons of Clovis. Clotilde was not Thuderic's mother, and yet this war had been waged on the pretext of avenging her parents. The key word here is pretext, as it belies more practical considerations for waging war during this time, namely the acquisition of land and plunder. So long as a Merovingian king could provide those two things, land and plunder, he was golden. Failing that, he risked losing face in front of his people, who at this point in time can still more accurately be described as followers rather than subjects, their loyalty not guaranteed, but instead earned or bought. Now, at this point, you may be wondering, what exactly happened after the death of Clodomer. After Clodomer's death, his children had been entrusted to their grandmother, Clovis's widow, Clotilde. Now perhaps would be a good time to mention that, through her deeds in life, Clotilde would become a saint in death, in large part because of the instrumental role she played in the conversion of Clovis and the Frankish people to Catholicism. Though she may have unintentionally caused the death of her son, by instigating the conflict against the Burgundians in the first place, Clotilde seems to have made up for it by being a loving and dutiful caretaker of her grandchildren. That is, until she was given an ultimatum by her sons, Clotaire and Childebert, who had decided that they would sweep aside their nephews and split their dead brother's lands between them. The pair presented their mother with the scissors and the sword, signifying their intention to have their nephews either tonsured or killed. Clotilde's response to the ultimatum was chilling. Even if we give her the benefit of the doubt and suppose that she might have failed in that pivotal moment to realize the weight that her words bore. It is better for me to see them dead rather than shorn if they are not raised to the kingship, she replied. Whether these words were spoken with quiet malice or desperation or unbridled rage, we cannot know for certain. Yet, in uttering them, Clotilde abandoned the grandsons under her protection, just ten and seven years old, to her ruthless sons. Clotaire, the youngest of her sons, is said to have performed the deed himself, stabbing both of his nephews to death. This while his older brother Childebert stood by weeping, unable to bring himself to take part in the violence except perhaps to kill a few nearby tutors and attendants. There was in fact a third nephew, although he managed to escape the scene of the slaughter with the intervention of a few of his followers who had smuggled him to safety. This last nephew had the wherewithal to be tonsured, cutting his long Frankish hair and retiring to a monastery for which he would be commemorated as a saint after his death. Thus, Clotaire and Childebert had succeeded in their ambition by some of the most vicious means imaginable, partitioning the lands of their dead brother between them. 
And then, life went on. Clovis's eldest son, Duderic, had taken part in the fight against the Burgundians and sat out the assassination of his nephews. But in case you think he had any scruples about the ordeal, think again. When it benefited him to do so, Thuderic banded with his brother Clotaire against a different target, the Thuringians in the northeast, who had reneged on a treaty and murdered Frankish hostages. Gregory of Tours tells us that Clovis' eldest son, Thuderic, roused his followers to battle by saying, quote, The Thuringians murdered our hostages in all sorts of different ways. They attacked our fellow countrymen and stole their possessions. They hung our young men up to die in the trees by the muscles of their thighs. They put more than 200 of our young women to death in the most barbarous way. They tied their arms around the necks of their horses, stampeded these animals in all directions by prodding them with goads, and so tore the girls to pieces. Or else they stretched them over the ruts of their roads, attached their arms and legs to the ground with stakes, and then drove heavily laden carts over them again and again until their bones were all broken and their bodies could be thrown out for the dogs and birds to feed on. What is more, the Thuringian king has now broken his promise to me and refuses utterly to do what he said he would. There is no doubt that we have right on our side. With God's help, we must attack them." End quote. In the lead-up to the decisive engagement of the conflict, the Thuringians dug ditches and covered them up with grass. Unfortunately for them, these traps did little to stop the Frankish cavalry, which surged forward in spite of all danger, lost some of its members, adjusted its course, and cut right through the Thuringian lines, plainly indicating to us just how clever ideas can, at times, crumple in the face of naked force. The conquest of Thuringia yielded not only new lands and riches, but also a wife for Clovis's youngest son, Clotaire, a Thuringian princess named Radegund, who Clotaire and Thuderic fiercely argued over until the former asserted his claim based on the fact that it had been his men who had captured her. Despite that, Clovis's eldest son, Thuderic, was at the height of his glory. And yet, even now, he could not let go of his ultimate ambition to reunite Francia. So while he and his brother Clotaire lingered in their newly conquered Thuringian lands, he plotted to have him assassinated. It had now been 20 years since the start of Thuderic's reign, but despite biding his time for so long, he bungled it. After Clotaire was summoned to his brother's presence, he arrived at a suspicious-seeming courtyard where he had the wherewithal to spot the feet of his would-be assassins, who were hidden behind a canvas that did not quite reach the ground. This put Clotaire on guard, and we are left to assume that he stuck by his bodyguards and took an alternate path to meet his brother. If there's a lesson to this story, it's that it's always a good idea to be aware of your surroundings, especially if you're a Merovingian king. The story doesn't end there, though. It actually gets better. The scheming Thuderic now had to think up an excuse for why he had summoned his brother Clotaire to his presence. Thinking fast, Thuderic gave him a silver tray that he had lying next to him, but he soon regretted the loss of this precious booty so much that he had his son, Thudebert, ask for it back. And Clotaire, either unsuspecting of this whole ordeal or simply playing along, actually gave the tray back. Meanwhile, Thuderic and Clotaire's brother, Childebert, became embroiled in his own bit of family drama. He had set his sights south, to Spain, where his sister, named Clotilde after their mother, had been married off to the Visigothic king, Amalaric. Despite the practical benefits of an alliance between the Franks and Visigoths, religious differences between Amalaric and Clotilde made the marriage increasingly untenable. Amalaric was a follower of the Arian creed of Christianity, while Clotilde was a Nicene Christian in the tradition of the Merovingian dynasty, respecting the orthodoxy of the Holy Trinity. Supposedly, whenever Clotilde went to church, Amalaric would make sure that she had dung and other filth thrown over her. When tension between the couple reached a fever pitch, Amalaric hit her with such violence that she started bleeding. But Clotilde would have the last laugh. She took a towel stained with her blood 
and sent it to her brother Childebert. This is purportedly what prompted Childebert's arrival, despite it sounding more like a convenient pretext for more land and wealth for the self-interested Childebert. It would be an easy conquest, since Amalaric quickly opted to escape instead of standing his ground and resisting. But just as Amalaric was about to set off with a fleet of his boats, he remembered that the precious stones he had meant to take on his journey were still locked away in his treasury. Well, as it turned out, that mistake, repeated long into the present day by anyone who's forgotten to turn the stove off before a road trip, would change the course of history. Amalaric decided to head back into the city and retrieve his precious stones, only to find that the way back to the port was blocked once he had recovered them. Having nowhere else to go, Amalaric made a mad dash for a nearby church where he expected to find refuge. But before he could get through the door, one of the warriors hunting him down throws what can only be described as a Hail Mary javelin guided to its destination in an irreversible act of fate. This left Amalaric mortally wounded, and that was the end of his story. The victorious Childebert then gathered up his troops, his plunder, and his sister, and headed home, only for another plot twist, the sudden and inexplicable death of his sister during the journey home. We hear no more about her, except that she was buried in Paris alongside her father, Clovis. Let us not forget that this was the Middle Ages, when death lurked around every corner, not only in the form of war and violence, but also disease, childbirth, infant mortality, and various other causes. In any case, we don't hear about the specifics, nor do we hear about Childebert mourning the sister he had saved in such a seemingly heroic manner. Instead, the next thing reported to us is that Childebert banded forces with his brother Clotair to attack Burgundy once again. Their eldest brother, Thuderic, was supposed to have joined them, as he had in the past, but he was concerned about the loyalty of his followers who made it clear to him that they were not satisfied with the idle spell of peace that had befallen them. Attempting to divert his men's attention without giving them an opportunity to defect to his brothers, Thuderic led them to a different region, Clermont-Ferrand, where they were given free reign to pillage everything in sight. It was one of Thuderic's last recorded acts, for not long after that, he died a natural death and passed his lands to his son, Thudebert, whom we have mentioned already. At this point in time, only two sons of Clovis were still alive, Childebert and his younger brother, Clotaire, the nephew killers. And now they had another nephew, Thudebert, standing in the way of yet more lands and wealth. But unfortunately for them, this wasn't another child they could murder in cold blood. Thudebert was in his prime, a warrior who had already proven himself on the battlefield and supposedly killed the legendary Danish ruler Higelac of Beowulf fame, when this prototypical Viking warrior king journeyed all the way to Francia to plunder its lands. Thudebert was thus able to fend off both of his uncles, and then managed to turn one against the other. Ultimately, though, the status quo between the three remained in place. Of the many Merovingian rulers who followed Clovis, Gregory of Tours seems to have held Thudebert in high esteem, calling him a great king, distinguished by every virtue. This is despite Thudebert's occasional flashes of pride and lust. This was, after all, the first Merovingian to mint gold coins depicting his own image, rather than a Roman emperor. If that's not vanity then I don't know what is. Furthermore, like other Merovingians, Thudebert had several wives and concubines, but one of these, the notorious Deuteria, was particularly eager to preserve his waning affections. According to Gregory of Tours, she went to such lengths, in fact, that she supposedly had her own daughter killed in a carefully orchestrated carriage accident. This is because she saw her daughter as a romantic rival for the affections of Thudebert. Like with many of the stories of the Merovingian period, we don't know if this one was an invention or part of a longer story. Whatever the case though, Thudebert had already been 34 when he ascended the throne, ruling for not quite 15 years before dying prematurely. After being killed by a wild bison he was tracking during a hunting expedition, he left a sickly son on the throne who would die not long after that. Ultimately, his lands passed to Clotaire, 
who also inherited his brother Childebert's lands after he died of old age. The victory of Clotair, the last of Clovis' sons, was now complete, his greatest allies in the end proving to be time and patience. Francia was reunited, if only briefly. Since Clotaire's victory was a long time in the coming, it did not take long for him to join his brothers and nephews in death, dooming the Merovingian cycle of internecine struggle to repeat itself. Clotaire had sired over eight children with various wives and concubines. Two of his sons had predeceased their father, and so the four that remained in the year 561 AD cleaved Francia into quadrants yet again. Cheribert, the eldest of the brothers, ruled from Paris, though not for very long. His reign was a short and dissolute one, notable mainly for the fact that he was the first Merovingian king to be excommunicated by the Pope. Why, you may ask? Well, Cherbert had four wives, not a problem in and of itself, except for the fact that two of them were sisters. Even in those days, that was a little bit much. Thus, after the short reign of Cheribert, his land would be split even further between his three younger brothers. In order of seniority, these were Guntram, who ruled the southeastern kingdom of Burgundy from the city of Orléans, Sigebert, who ruled the kingdom of Austrasia in the northeast, and lastly, Choperic, who ruled the kingdom of Neustria in the northwest. The eldest of them is known to history as Good King Guntram for his temperate, forgiving, generous, and pious nature. He is one of the very, very few Merovingians that comes across as a good guy. Despite that, or maybe because of it, he doesn't always cut the most formidable figure. At one point, for example, Guntram begs a congregation at a Parisian church not to assassinate him, at least for the next three years. That way, he explained, he could raise his successors and secure the Merovingian legacy. Nevertheless, good King Guntram managed to play the game well enough, even as the families of his two other brothers became embroiled in a 40-year feud that left the Merovingians permanently weakened. The youngest of Clotaire's sons, Choperic, had made his motives crystal clear from the get-go, attempting unsuccessfully to claim the entire Frankian kingdom for himself right after his father's death. His brothers didn't let Choperic get away with it, and a state of hostility soon existed between him and Sigebert. But it was only when Sigebert got married that the standoff between the brothers reached a head. Unlike the many Merovingian rulers who settled for lowborn women, Sigebert had found himself an impressive, intelligent, noble wife the Visigothic princess, Brunhild. Not one to be outdone so easily, Choperic set about getting hitched to Brunhild's sister, Gauswinth. Despite her initial reluctance to marry Choperic, their marriage began smoothly enough. Elated by the dowry he received from his in-laws, Choperic made preparations for his bride so that when she arrived in Francia, all his army was assembled with bent knees and bowed heads a romantic display such as only a king can provide. But as with other Merovingian marriages, it would be marred by religious differences. Gauswinth was an Aryan Christian, whereas Choperic was a Nicene who nonetheless still practiced polygamy, the residue of his family's pagan past. Initially, Choperic relented to his in-laws' requests to honor the sanctity of a monogamous marriage, publicly abandoning his other wives and concubines. But before long, Choperic seems to have hopped back into bed with the woman who had him wrapped around his thumb, the infamous Fredegund, a servant who had risen high by virtue of her beauty and cunning, who would go down in history as one of the most dangerous femme fatales of all time. Fredegund was perhaps the most consummate female political operator of the Merovingian world. For the moment, her biggest piece of leverage was Choperic's affections, which she was willing to preserve at any price, including, perhaps, the life of Gauswinth, who was found strangled in her bed by an unknown assailant. Little doubt remained when, only a few days after that, Fredegund and Choperic were wed. Now, recall that Choperic's brother, Sigebert, was married to Gauswinth's sister, Brunhild, the whole arrangement might have been kind of cute under different circumstances, 
but this was the world of the Merovingians. So instead of double dates, we get a blood feud. Brunhild was out for revenge for her sister's murder, and Sigebert was only too happy to oblige, having already locked horns with his brother Chilperic in the past. At first, it seemed that Sigebert would be the brother to triumph. Over the next few years, he conquered most of Chilperic's kingdom bit by bit, until in his moment of triumph, he was struck dead, not by a warrior's axe or a wild animal's horns, but instead by the daggers of two assassins sent by none other than Fredegund. Sigebert's widow, Brunhild, now placed herself and her son under the protection of good King Guntram. Knowing her rival's duplicitous ways, Brunhild had this son, Childebert II, lowered from a window in a bag and spirited away to the city of Metz, where he would be safe, at least for the moment. Since Guntram would lose both of his sons to dysentery, he named his son, Childebert II, as his heir, and decided to safeguard his lands against the ravenous power couple of Chilperic and Fredegund, who persisted in trying to wrest control of Guntram's lands until Chilperic's death. We are told that Chilperic died on a hunting excursion, not because of some wild animal, but at the hands of another unknown assailant, who stabbed him to death when he let his guard down. I know what you're asking. Could his wife, Fredegund, have been involved? Did she perhaps get tired of sharing power with her husband? Did she have another motive? Assassination was, after all, a tool that Fredegund commonly resorted to. Having succeeded in assassinating her brother-in-law, Sigebert, and making multiple attempts to do so against virtually all of her enemies, including her sister-in-law Brunhild, her other brother-in-law Guntram, and her nephew Childebert II. Like other Merovingian queens, Fredegund had been jealous of her daughter and supposedly wanted her dead too. Gregory of Tours tells us, quote, Fredegund waited for her opportunity and under the pretense of magnanimity, took her daughter to the treasure room and showed her the king's jewels in a large chest. Feigning fatigue, she exclaimed, I am weary, put thou in thy hand and take out what thou mayest find. The mother thereupon forced down the lid on her neck and would have killed her had not the servants finally rushed to her aid." End quote. Ultimately, we cannot know for certain whether Fredegund played any part in her husband's death, nor can we know whether this story involving her daughter has any basis in truth. The story with her daughter sounds too much like a recycled amalgamation of the past stories that we have heard of the Merovingians. Nonetheless, it's interesting that Gregory accuses Fredegund of attempting the murder of her daughter, but does not make any accusations related to the death of her husband Chilperic. This suggests to us that Gregory did have some interest in getting the facts right. However, he certainly had his biases. Gregory's assessment of the now-deceased Chilperic in particular seems unfair. He goes so far as to call him the Nero and Herod of his time, most likely in large part due to Chilperic's run-ins with the clergy and with the city of Tours, Gregory's hometown. In life, Chilperic consciously emulated the Roman emperors, building amphitheaters in Soissons and Paris to hold circuses for its people. He would have probably been shocked to be compared to Nero. Another side to Chilperic was his pseudo-intellectualism, which set him apart from the rest of the Merovingian warrior kings content to rule, for the most part, with the sword. Unlike his predecessors, Chilperic was not just literate. He went as far as composing poetry and making attempts to reform the alphabet through the introduction of four new characters. Chilperic was actually a contemporary of Gregory of Tours, and there exists a piece of art made much later that depicts him listening with sublime disinterest as Chilperic reads him one of his bad poems. This was all harmless, but a more dangerous side of Chilperic's intellectualism came out when he discussed matters of theology. Chilperic had some radical ideas about the Trinity, which only served to further indict him in the eyes of our narrator, Gregory, who once had occasion to reprimand him. Gregory told the king, quote, It would suit you better to watch out that you do not make God or his saints angry, for you should know that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all distinct in person. In these three persons there is one glory, one eternity, one power. 
To which Choperic responded, I will expound these matters to wiser men than you, and they will agree with me. End quote. Gregory tells us that Choperic had an annoying habit of doing this kind of thing, dismissing everyone who disagreed with him as an idiot, including some of the most prominent theologians in history up to that point. This got under Gregory's skin, and he was supposed to have retorted with, quote, He will be no wise man, but an idiot who would want to follow what you propose. End quote. Some way to talk to a king, and a vivid illustration of just how much power a bishop could wield in those days. Part of the reason why was their link to the ancient Roman past, not only through Christianity, but because many bishops, like Gregory of Tours himself, were descended from ancient Roman senatorial families. Nonetheless, with the death of Choperic, Gregory must have breathed a sigh of relief, even if things were only going to get worse from here. Choperic's widow, Fredegund, arguably much worse than him, was now in control of the kingdom of Neustria in the heart of France, ruling as regent on behalf of her son with the blessing of the ever-forgiving Guntram. In opposition to her was Brunhild, ruling Austrasia in the northeast. Officially, Brunhild was no longer regent by this time, yet she still exercised considerable influence over her young son Childebert II. Despite occasionally biting the hand that fed him, Childebert II succeeded to the throne of Burgundy upon the death of the good King Guntram, and he was now poised to take over all of Francia in the twilight years of the 6th century. All that stood in his path was his mother's ancient enemy, Fredegund. As we know by now, this was not a woman to be trifled with. Fredegund personally led her forces into battle like some evil proto-incarnation of Joan of Arc, and she routed the forces of her nephew, Childebert II, who died the following year after being poisoned. You can guess who his mother, Brunhild, blamed for the assassination. If you had asked Brunhild, she would tell you that all the great tragedies of her life could be laid at the feet of one woman. Her sister, her husband, and her son alike, all dead before their time because of Fredegund. But for all this tragedy, Brunhild did not despair. Instead, she ruled as regent of Austrasia and Burgundy on behalf of her grandsons. Everything was in place for a final showdown between these two feuding queens just when Brunhild's hated rival, Fredegund, died of natural causes. Fredegund was succeeded by her son, but in case you think his ascension to the throne gave Brunhild any respite, you would be sadly mistaken. Fredegund and Chilperic's son, Clotaire II, would carry his family's feud to its calamitous conclusion. By this point, Brunhild had made her fair share of enemies, sometimes ruling with a heavy hand in order to raise the troops and funds necessary to sustain her feud. As a consequence, a coalition consisting of her vassals and Clotaire II succeeded in overthrowing Brunhild, who would be shown no mercy. Proving himself his mother's equal in cruelty, Clotaire II ordered that Brunhild be tied by her hands and her hair to wild horse, dragged before the ranks of his army, and then quartered and burned. This description comes from another source, not Gregory of Tours, for by this time, our faithful narrator was dead too. Had he borne witness to this display, Gregory would have been even more disillusioned with the state of Frankian affairs than he already was. Midway through the account which forms the basis of our narrative, Gregory had already complained that, quote, to this day, one is still amazed and astonished at the disasters which befell the Frankish people. We can only contrast how their forefathers used to behave with how they themselves are behaving today. After the missionary preaching of the bishops, the earlier generations were converted from their pagan temples and turned towards the churches. Now they are busy plundering those same churches. The older folk listened with all their heart to the Lord's bishops and had great reverence for them. Nowadays they do not listen and they persecute instead. Their forefathers endowed the monasteries and churches. The sons tear them to pieces and demolish them." End quote. Gregory's description sounds a little like the real-world manifestation of the vision of Clovis's father, Childeric, 
who imagined his royal line transmogrifying from a procession of mythic creatures to a pack of wild bears, wolves, and dogs. But what of our mama bears, the queens Fredegund and Brunhild, not Merovingians by birth, but through marriage? To think that Fredegund died peacefully in her bed, while Brunhild was consigned to the agonizing death of being torn limb by limb after losing all the people close to her, seems like it could be the greatest travesty of the entire Merovingian period. While Fredegund left behind an almost entirely infamous reputation, we are told that Brunhild managed, despite it all, to bring to fruition various projects and enterprises, like the renovation of old Roman roads, the construction of new fortifications and churches, the maintenance of the army, and the establishment of sound finances. While Brunhild seems to have thrived as a diplomat and administrator, Fredegund's greatest strengths appear to have been in the ways of war and intrigue. All that being said, this stark difference in the reputation of our two queens should not and cannot really surprise us. After all, our narrator Gregory of Tours was given his bishopric by none other than Brunhild and Sigebert. His political and spiritual loyalties lay with them, and Choperic and Fredegund's encroachment against the ecclesiastical bulwark of the Frankish realm only served to alienate Gregory further. If you had asked Gregory of Tours what held Frankish society together, he would tell you that it was this ecclesiastical bulwark consisting of the bishops, the saints, and the pope in Rome. Therefore, to Gregory, Choperic represented nothing less than an existential threat to the established Merovingian order. Even so, Gregory himself recognized that this order was held together by a combination of Gallo-Roman administrative practices, put to use mainly for the purpose of tax collection, as well as sheer naked force. Since the days of Clovis, Merovingian rulers fought tooth and nail to maintain control over their followers, who still occasionally expected and exercised the liberties characteristic of a tribal people. It was a trade of sorts, the ruler offering plunder and the ruled reciprocating with tax revenue. And it worked. There was never any viable alternative to Merovingian rule, despite the almost never-ending dynastic struggles. If a Merovingian king was weak, then in due course his followers ended up serving one of his stronger brothers, sons, or nephews who rose to the task of ruling. One way or another, a Merovingian would always end up in charge. But in the aftermath of Fredegund and Brunhild's feud, Merovingian rule seems to have been undermined in a fundamental way by an ascendant Frankish aristocracy, enriched and ennobled by the countless conquests of preceding years. It was increasingly these aristocrats that appeared on the battlefield as representatives of the Merovingian kings, who were not always so keen as Clovis to lead from the front. Immediately following the conclusion of the great Merovingian feud in 613 AD, Clotaire II, also called Clotaire the Young, had to contend with the Frankish nobility that began by asking for the finger before biting off the entire hand. Within a year of his coronation as the king of a united Francia, they forced Clotaire to sign the Edict of Paris, which gave the Frankish nobility new rights and privileges, including more oversight over court positions as well as tax cuts. A couple of years after this edict, Clotaire was forced to make a further concession. The mayor of the palace, an important court position, became an office that was held for life. These mayors, the first of which had been servants concerned strictly with the affairs of the palace, steadily accumulated more and more influence until they eventually became the power brokers behind the Frankish throne, a byproduct of their proximity to power during tumultuous times. Already, one mayor of the palace played an instrumental role in the capture of Brunhild, having turned her over to Clotaire the Young. Now there was another mayor, Pepin, whose name you would do well to remember. This Pepin pressured Clotaire to give up the entirety of Austrasia, a third of his realm, more or less, to his heir, Dagobert. Even though this would split the realm, Clotaire seems to have had no choice but to oblige him, since Pepin, alongside his great ally, Bishop Arnulf of Metz, refused to rise up in support of Brunhild at a critical time in Clotaire's struggle against her. 
Obviously, Clotaire could renounce this obligation had Pepin not commanded vast wealth and influence. Thus, in 623 AD, Pepin became mayor of the palace at Austrasia, raising the young Merovingian prince Dagobert to maturity alongside Bishop Arnulf. According to a popular legend encouraged by Charlemagne, the descendants of these two men, Pepin and Arnulf, would be none other than the Carolingians. For the moment, they still had a king to serve. When Dagobert assumed the throne after the death of his father, Clotaire the Young, he sought to rectify his family's situation. Combining the ruthless energy of a Clovis and the cunning of a Charlemagne, as one historian memorably put it, he was the last of the Merovingians to hold real power, with his domain encompassing not just Austrasia, Neustria, and Burgundy, but also Aquitaine. Upon his death in 639 AD, Dagobert was the first king to be buried in the Basilica of Saint Denis, which today serves as the resting place of 42 kings, 32 queens, and 63 princes and princesses. As historical tradition has it, the death of Dagobert heralded the era of the Rolfonion, the so-called do-nothing kings of the Merovingian dynasty, who were little more than the puppets of the palace mayors. What can we say of these kings? We hear of a fresh bevy of Sigeberts, Childeberts, and Clotaires succeeding to the various thrones of a disunited Francia. Though their authority was indeed curbed by the palace mayors, there was still such a thing as going too far. One mayor, Grimwald, the son of the very same Pepin we just discussed, managed to convince one childless Merovingian ruler to adopt his own son as his heir, and this scheme succeeded. Upon the demise of this Merovingian ruler, Grimwald's son ascends to the throne as Childebert the Adopted, despite the fact that the departed king had by that time sired a true-blooded male heir. Grimwald thus took the extraordinary step of having the true Merovingian heir, just seven at this time, tonsured and exiled to Ireland. This was just too brazen, a move decades ahead of its time, and so Grimwald and his son were both executed by a vengeful Merovingian claimant. Most mayors played a subtler game in the latter half of the 7th century, content to name Merovingian heirs, wage advantageous wars, and broke favorable peace agreements. And yet it became increasingly clear to those inside and outside the Frankish realm where the real power lay. By 668 AD, the Venerable Bede, a famous English monk and historian, tells us that a contemporary of his could only travel through the Frankish kingdoms with a mayor's permission. Now, we've already discussed Pepin, who would go down in history as Pepin the Old. We now arrive at the time of Pepin II, otherwise known as Pepin of Herstal, a region in modern Belgium where he was probably born. By the year 680, Pepin II was the de facto ruler of Austrasia, firmly ensconced as its palace mayor. Within a decade, he would also become mayor of the palaces of Neustria and Burgundy, at which time he took the title Duke and Prince of the Franks. Notably, his battle for control of Francia was fought not with a Merovingian, but with another palace mayor who, had he been victorious, may have established a dynasty of his own that would leave the history books devoid of the name Charlemagne. In the event, Pepin II, ruling a reunited Francia, was able to turn his attention against the Alemanni, the Frisians, and the Franconians, neighboring peoples who threatened his realm. But as you may have expected by now, this unity was not to last. In 714 AD, Pepin II died at the ripe old age of 79, and he took the significant step of naming his grandson, the eight-year-old Thuduald, as his heir, as if he were a monarch. Thuduald's father had been Pepin's eldest son, who predeceased him. His grandmother, Pepin's first wife, was the one who convinced him to name the child as his heir. In doing so, Pepin passed over his other son, who was still very much alive. A man who would be known to history as Charles Martel. Martel meant the hammer in Old French, a name that Charles earned on the field of battle, 
his military record virtually without precedent in Frankish history, unless one went all the way back to Clovis himself. This was a man who had to fight from the very beginning, taken prisoner by Pepin's widow, Plectrude, who had cheated him out of his inheritance and was worried about the repercussions, Charles was able to escape from his dungeon in the chaos of an independence revolt in 715 AD. Already counting on the fact that he would reclaim his inheritance, Charles raised a force of his own to defeat this independence faction. But because Plectrude still held power, he did not have enough manpower to change the course of the war. That did not stop him from trying though, and in the Battle of Colne, Charles suffered his first and only defeat, the one blemish on an otherwise pristine military career. Undeterred, Charles recuperated with his men in the hills of the Eiffel, a region near Köln in modern Germany. He then mounted an ambush against the enemy forces, who were so surprised by this bold maneuver that they fled despite, in all likelihood, still outnumbering Charles' forces. He followed up this victory with another at the Battle of Vinci, but before he could march on Paris and end this independence revolt once and for all, he had to root out the scheming Plectrude and her grandson, who were ensconced in Colm, and reunite the forces meant to be under his command. Charles was, of course, victorious, but this is when he surprises us, in a good way. Charles spared both his father's widow, Plectrude, who was allowed to retire to a convent, as well as his nephew, Dudewald, who served in Charles' army. In explaining Charles' repudiation of Merovingian cruelty, one historian said, quote, Either Charles Martel possessed a degree of decency and kindness to defeated foes unknown in that age, or his belief in himself was so great that he felt he could afford kindness as the ultimate show of strength in allowing them to live after their various plots and machinations against him." End quote. One is reminded at once of Julius Caesar, whose own policy of clemency set him well apart from his contemporaries. With Caesar, it is more readily clear to us that this policy was meant to be a politically advantageous one, and I am tempted to say the same of Charles Martel, who proves his cunning to us both on and off the battlefield. Knowing that he still needed a puppet Merovingian ruler to cloak his power behind, Charles appointed one before squashing another rebellion mounted by the combined realms of Neustria and Aquitaine. The aim of this rebellion was to knock Charles' family down a few pegs and to put the Merovingian prince, Choperic II, on the throne. After his victory against them, Charles' confidence was such that he spared Choperic, famously allowing him a palace as the Annals of Metz record. Charles then turned his sights outward against the Saxons, Bavarians, Alemanni, and the Frisians the latter of which he would have to crush a second time when they rose up against him, destroying their pagan temples as punishment. At that time, Charles played the part of kingmaker like past palace mayors, until in the last four years of his reign, he felt sufficiently secure to rule in his own name, without a Merovingian king. Of his many impressive deeds, Charles Martel is perhaps most famous for the Battle of Tours in 732 AD, during which he defeated the forces of the Umayyad Caliphate. Later historians, as esteemed as Edward Gibbon, made much of the victory, declaring that it represented a pivotal moment not just in the history of Francia, but all of Europe. Seen in this light, Charles Martel was cast in the role of savior of Christendom, with his success ultimately confining the Umayyads and their successors to the Iberian Peninsula and ending their ambition to expand beyond the Pyrenees mountain range. As one might imagine, the topic is heatedly debated today, with some reciting the arguments of old, and others downplaying the significance of the victory. Another point of contention is the size of each army, although today we think that both sides had around 15 to 20,000 men, a far cry from the figures we had in the past of 75,000 francs up against 400,000 Umayyads, but nonetheless still a massive battle in that age. For all intents and purposes, it seems as if the Umayyads had underestimated their enemy, wholly ignorant about the threat posed by the Franks. Up until the Battle of Tours, the Umayyads had been opposed chiefly by just Otto the Great, the ruler of an independent Aquitaine which had slipped from Frankish control. 
ever politically savvy. Charles Martel only agreed to join Otto against the Umayyads if he submitted his realm to Frankish control, which Otto agreed to. Charles Martel thereby secured everlasting fame, with more name recognition today than Clovis. However, this can at least partly be explained by his association with his grandson, Charlemagne. In Charlemagne's day, Charles Martel would remain a popular figure, but the clergy of that time would probably break out into either laughter or a shouting fit if one were to refer to Charles as the savior of Christendom. The standards for piety were higher in those days, and Charles was at times perceived to be acting against the interests of the Roman Catholic Church, namely through his secularization of their property in order to fund his military conquests, which his family wealth, however considerable, went only some way toward paying off. Nonetheless, it's hard to believe that none of these clergymen would be sympathetic to the idea that such appropriations were necessary in a time of perceived crisis, especially in the face of the threat posed by the Umayyads, regardless of whether they had come north to conquer or just to plunder. Ultimately, Charles Martel bequeathed to two of his sons a unified Frankish kingdom, and for once in our two-century-long narrative of bloody upheavals and shaky successions, Charles' two sons, Carloman and Pepin III, seem to have gotten along just fine. They did have to sideline their two other brothers, who, according to Charles' wishes, did not get any land, but they did not fight one another. Instead, the brothers seemed to have supported one another. Putting another puppet Merovingian in charge and then neutralizing the Aquitanians, Saxons, and Bavarians as necessary. Notably, these brothers were able to square the circle, keeping both the armies and the church happy, something their father had struggled with. Even though both of them had enjoyed a theological education at the Abbey Church of St. Denis, Carloman was the more religiously minded brother, and in the year 747 AD, he chose to retire to a monastic life. Rather than being tonsured at sword point, Carloman would be tonsured in Rome by the Pope himself. He was, in the words of one historian, quote, the first of a new type of saintly king, more interested in religious devotion than royal power, who frequently appeared in the following three centuries, and who was an indication of the growing impact of Christian piety on Germanic society, end quote. But, before the saintly king would give his life to God, he had some unsettled business, which he resolved at the infamous blood court at Cannstatt, during which he lured thousands of noblemen who had taken part in an uprising against him and summarily arrested and executed them, effectively wiping the tribe of the Alemanni off the face of the earth. After that, he couldn't have left his brother, Pepin III, in a better position who went on in the year 751 AD to take the unprecedented step of deposing the last Merovingian ruler, Childeric III, becoming king of the Franks in his own right with the blessing of the papacy. The reign of the Merovingians had officially ended, not with a bang, but with a whimper. Little is remembered of their last ruler, Childeric III, who truly seems to have been a do-nothing king. However, a wonderful painting exists entitled The Last of the Merovingians, which shows a bound and powerless Childeric being tonsured. As his auburn locks tumble to the ground, this last Merovingian king must have felt the same humiliation that many of his defeated ancestors had once felt. But unlike them, this defeat was not just his own. It was the defeat of an entire dynasty, the end of an era and the start of a new one. Though the Merovingians' time under the sun might seem to you messy and dysfunctional, an era of incessant civil war, scheming, and kinslaying, it is worth reassessing all that the Merovingians had achieved. The administrative structure that had developed during the Roman period was carried into the Merovingian one, its primary function being the division of the realm into taxable provinces. There was also an ecclesiastical equivalent consisting of dioceses which were tax-exempt. Next to plunder, tax revenue was what funded the Merovingian war machine, and gradually the successful levying of taxes allowed the Frankish people to rely far less on pillaging their neighbors. 
the Franks also circulated Roman coinage, until, starting with Dudebert, they began to mint gold and silver coins with their own likenesses. This facilitated more efficient forms of tax collection and commerce, even if plundered treasure, jewels, and gems still constituted a major source of Frankish wealth. The Merovingians did not just preserve the Roman administrative and monetary structure, they also came to rely on Gallo-Roman Latin as the official language at court, with Merovingian officials writing on papyrus and employing Tyronian notes, a Latin shorthand employed by Cicero's secretary, Tyro. Like the Roman emperors Hadrian and Domitian, a hallmark of Merovingian rule was personal presence. A king's appearance on the battlefield could change the course of a battle, just as his appearance in a newly conquered province could cement his control over it. In the fashion of late Gallo-Roman governors, the Merovingians made a great show of traveling around their realm in ox carts to make themselves available to petitioners far and wide. In the realm of law, the Merovingians made limited advances, especially in comparison to some of their neighbors like the Visigoths and Burgundians, who went further in the codification of civil law. Merovingian officials preferred to memorize old legal precedents rather than invent new ones, and lacked a codified Roman-based system of laws. Though the Saline Law Code that was compiled during Clovis's reign encompassed such matters as inheritance and criminal law, it was intended for the Franks, with other peoples like the Gallo-Romans and Burgundians being subject to regional legal systems. As regards the aristocracy, the comites and duches that emerged from the later Merovingian period took their name from old Roman offices, and they would be the precursors to the illustrious counts and dukes of the kingdom of France. Ultimately, the fact that the Merovingians succeeded in ruling Francia for as long as 250 years is a feat in itself. At the time of their fall, the Merovingian dynasty had reigned longer than any other royal family in Western Europe. Ian Wood, a leading authority on this period, has gone so far as to say that no other state equaled the overall achievements of the Franks in the 6th, 7th, and 8th centuries. Whether we go that far or not, we must acknowledge that the Merovingians have been overlooked for far too long. Their reign is too often seen as a barbaric gap in the late antique period, a dark age preceding the Carolingian Renaissance. But that is a disservice to the Merovingians, without whom there would have been no Carolingians and no Charlemagne. 23 years of donations to your parish and this is what this guy sees hanging over me? You should have never gone to a psychic. It's divination. It's the devil. They're completely unsanctioned by the church. Psychics are heretics and thieves who practice witchcraft. There's no validity to anything he told you. Your problem's a spiritual matter. Maybe. But irregardless, I should have had immunity to all of this shit. I should have been covered by my donations. When the organ needed a rejob, who was there? When the priests and the altar boys needed new whites, who picked up the tab? You should have come to me first, and none of this would have happened. But don't worry, Paul. I'm here. I can help you. It's too late. You've been slacking off on me, and you left me unprotected. I'm cutting you off for good. You ain't never going to see another dime from me.